So today I'm going to be continuing sharing on um, some awesome wisdom from Melody Beatty, Codependent No More. And I'm going to start with the topic of anger management. So she says we got to practice patience because we have to have courage to trust God. Waiting is an art. This is talking about the, the underlying root to anger. We have to burn off energy somehow. We got to discharge our stress. Could be anything from dancing, working, organizing, getting outside, gardening, building, playing, cleaning. You'll find ways that you discharge energy and feel peace and calm after, feel balanced, right? And um, we have to also practice not beating ourselves up for feeling angry or that others got angry because it's not, you know, we, as long as we're not getting hurt and we're not hurting, Anger is actually a safe way to release this energy. So if we're not screaming at people, calling them names, but we could do things to discharge this energy. For example, we could write letters we don't send. And it's like, if I could feel angry about anything, nobody would ever know, and it wasn't wrong to feel this way, what would I be angry, what I would be angry about is this. And, um, that's a way to start getting rid of guilt, unearned guilt, which is that it doesn't help. God will forgive us and it doesn't judge and doesn't judge us as harshly as we judge ourselves because we like want to keep punishing ourselves for the same thing many times when we already punished ourselves for that. And it's common when starting to work with anger that we see it happen more frequently. So we might say like, I have this guilt because if I was, I shouldn't be angry about this, but God made us that we did get angry about it, that we want things a different way, that we are different. So it's like this, we might frequently get angry when we start noticing because it's like a kid with a new toy. Hey, I'm allowed to get angry. Hey, anger exists. I don't have to be in denial anymore. And we're starting to learn a new way of coping and being. So it's like a process that we practice. That's why I started here today saying patience because we it refines and it settles over time. And we've got to surf this like godly wave. And this teacher, Ray Shigalov, talks about how from exploration, we have two choices. Two ways to get to mastery. One is through development, developing skills. And this is how we, um, we, we, we have the rage. and It's a rage to master. So instead of mastering something outside of us and feeling enraged that it's not working toward our, our need or desire, instead we have a rage to master. I can't get enough of this. I want to con like, control the other parts of my life by focusing on this one new hobby or excitement. Another path from exploration to mastery is to implement and to experiment. So this is not necessarily to master. This is expression. This is creative flow. This is learning. This is curiosity. And eventually you become a master just because you're flirting with this fun new thing all the time. So again, one way is there's two paths. We'll summarize them as Kesar and pause. Kesar is like the crown of light. So the crown of light is like, wow, it's so fun. I'm feeling inspired and enlightened and empowered and creative. And I want to do this because it's a great experience versus I want to get good at it because, which is the pause, which is I'm going to pause others things. And it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on this and do, do it. Cause I want to get it to have a good result. Like I want to wash the stain out of the dirty clothes and that is my enemy. So like I read that in a story today, somebody was saying they love washing clothes because they turn the stains into their enemies. So it's like we become excellent at washing clothes or because it's so fun and every time it's creative, but there's no, it's okay if the stains don't come out. So that's our two pathways. Um, and then for example, with, um, that's like not from Melody Beatty, but I'm going to give one more aside. Um, and I'm going to actually go back to like, we just had a holiday, which is perfect for this. Because it's all about a new download, right? So it's about like seeing who we are and then having a year to get the, the all with great blessing, with great power, comes great responsibility, comes great challenge. So Rabbi Yeshua Gaikov talks a lot about this. So we can't admit our sins. We can't start saying all the things we did wrong on the day of. Like on the day, we're actually supposed to spend Rosh Hashanah, for example, having pure thoughts. So there, again, there's these two pathways, right? One is like, I'm going to master this negative aspect or I'm going to enjoy so much that I'm only going to have enjoyment living in me to share. I'm not going to do anything that 
brings guilt or shame or separation, right? So it's like the shofar we use as a technology. It's like this um, animal horn that we blow. I don't personally, but like the the designated individual blows it, and it is a deep sound healing that brings us to pure thought because the sound is so not like a siren. It could be compared to like a baby cry, but not even like a regular baby. Like a baby in that moment that doesn't even want anything but the purity of the connection. Doesn't even want the food or the mother. A baby crying as if the cry itself will soothe it, right? So a prosecutor cannot be an advocate. And we're given an example in the Torah about a bull. So when, we, when, when an animal becomes a damager and it harms humans multiple times, we call it a damaging animal. And there's this idea that Satan... Satan dances between the horns, between the eyes of the month of Nisan, which is the month when it's in spring. It's, um, it's when the, it says it's like there's a black ox and it's dancing between its eyes and it's a bull that comes out to drink. It says don't, it has a desire. So, so the desire aspect in Kabbalah we refer to as the right, the left arm because it's fresh, nutrient-rich blood. That's where our passion, our anger comes from. It's like when a bull's eating, it says to run away, you have to like kick something on it sometimes because it might think you want its food and attack you. So there's this idea that in Nisan, there's this energy, Satan, Satan, the devil energy, that there's not enough. It's going to start eating more and more because there's all this fresh new growth and it wants, it wants. <clears throat> Bless me. To the point where it gorges. This is like what anger does. It's like, I didn't get my way. I'm going to get all my way. I'm going to scream and, and be out of control. Well, see, I even scared the cat. So I wanted to show anger. So, or what urgency is, right? It's loud. It's aggressive. And then we look at like um, the Akedas Yitzhak, Isaac, which was the sacrifice, the, the binding. So God bet on Avraham with the Satan. God said, no, he doesn't want us so much. You know, he doesn't want it so much. He doesn't want his son more than he wants to please me. And Isaac had bragged that he would sacrifice everything when his brother Ishmael said he was circumcised at 13 and he felt it and he didn't move, right? Versus Isaac was an eight-day-old baby. So this time, Isaac, who was in his 30s, could have ran away. He was a big man. But Isaac, Yitzhak, Isaac recovered. It took him three years in, in the Garden of Eden for this. They say that the Garden of Eden healed him for three years after he was bound. And actually, that he did really actually get us in uh, a slice. Even though it was stopped and God said, no, I'm providing an animal for this. But it was like the Satan bet on Abraham. And then Isaac had to show that he wouldn't move when he was going to risk everything, not just the circumcision. And moving forward, so there's this um, interpreter called the Baal Tosif who says there's an issue with adding a mitzvah. For example, like, this is where it comes from, is like, you don't want to do extra, like, sitting an extra day on Sukkot without differentiating that it's not Sukkot anymore, like this holiday, Sukkot, eight days of the tabernacles. Or on Passover holiday, which is like the Nisan time, the Aries season that I mentioned before in fall, in spring, um, you know, you wouldn't eat matzah the day before, which is the, the bread, the, the unleavened bread, the bread of poverty, commemorating that they ran out of Egypt. Um, or you wouldn't have a second Sabbath because the seventh day is supposed to be the favor day, the day that we just let go and we want whatever's being given. It's a practice of meditation to receive what's, what God wants to give. And then we also know that like um, the only angel that's going to get its judgment at the time when Messiah comes and the shofar blows is the Satan and so Hashem showed the face of the Messiah, Ben Joseph, the one that is part of the purification process. There's two angles. There's one of the leadership and one of the purification to get ready and then to be, uh, and then to arrive. So the getting ready aspect is like God showed this to the face of the angel, Satan, and 
um, he learns about impermanence even as the other angels can exist in the times of the Messiah. So um, it's going to get slaughtered. So this angel got afraid of the shofar. And that's why we blow it. So we're here to break up that desire, right? This left arm desire of wanting more that gets us angry and break open our mind. And Satan is the energy that likes to cause strife and quarrels because it gets in the way when a mitzvah, um, like, is, so for example, a mitzvah is like a binding, like to be able to be bound up to holiness, like to be bound to holiness is to be commanded, is to not have any other master. So it, like, for example, the Satan will get in the way of a gathering of like Jewish young people um, by making the boys and girls dance together and get distracted from the purpose of what they're doing. Or when there's a table of food and people forget that the food is supposed to give us energy and we're gathering together to speak like holy words, instead people might be gossiping. So we got to actually be as Jewish people um, who identify, especially with all this material, as um, as having these values. And if and people who don't identify as Jewish have to be able to serve people who identify as Jewish because everyone needs to be a good host in this world for the Lord of hosts, right? The Lord of hosts is the grand host that made all these hosts. And then we are all guests. So Messiah is the energy that we're being a better host for in the world. We're revealing the light, right? So we, it says that those will come and lick the feet and fall on their faces and lick up the dust of the Messiah, the energy. And um, in other words, the dust will transform to be messianic dust. And everyone will come to be servants to the Jews and to Messiah, the ones who are willing to be um, suppressing our anger, not being patient, you know, being patient, choosing a pathway of developing skills, implementing and experimenting, um, being creative, um, breaking open our mind, expressing our extra energy so we don't take it out on anyone, right? Now I'm going to continue with from Melody Beatty, and I'm going to say here, um, you know, two more, like basically one more theme, this rescuing, rescuing caretaking theme of others' responsibilities and how that does lead to resentment and self-pity. So first of all, we're enabling others to not help their self or suffer their own consequences that would help them to grow and mature and integrate. Second of all, their thoughts and feelings. So this is the two angles. Their thoughts, feelings, behavior, and, um, you know, decisions. Really their well-being, their destiny, their growth stops being their responsibility. So first of all, we're, we're taking away their pain and we're taking away their growth. Okay. So how do we know when we're doing that? Now that we know that's not clearly not what we want to do. We don't want to be enablers and we don't want to take too much responsibility. So we do something when we don't want to. We say yes when we mean no. We do something for someone when they're capable of doing it themselves and it would be appropriate for them to do their self. We are meeting people's needs without being asked or before we were agreed even to do so. And we're doing more than our fair share of work after our help is actually requested. When we consistently give more than we receive in a particular situation or we do other people's thinking for them, speaking for them, suffering their consequences for them, solving their problems for them, fixing their feelings, putting more interest and activity into a joint effort than the other person is doing. So we're carrying more of our load and not asking for what we really want or need or desire. And um, a lot of this can be summarized as solving other people's problems for them. Seeing problems when they're not necessarily our problems to solve because they are part of the other person's growth. So this issue looks friendlier than it is because of victimness of the person we're helping. So we kind of make them out to be so unable, right? We're enabling them. We make them out to be disabled. And we get upset at them when it was an illusion that they were disabled because we wasted ourselves, And we assumed the incompetency of them. And also, it's not really love because a compassion, a true helping and a kindness is when our assistance is actually wanted and needed and we actually want to assist and, and, and share so this just this pattern brings discomfort, awkwardness, and urgency, pity, guilt, self-righteousness, anxiety, extreme responsibility, fear, a sense of being forced or compelled, feeling more competent than others, like arrogance or saintliness, right? Um, even martyrdom, mild or severe reluctance to really do anything at a certain point, and really blaming others for our position. So... Why do we do this? Because we get to feel temporarily needed and we get to take care of ourselves by, um, by, by avoiding the problems we have 
um, sorry, we avoid taking care of ourselves by avoid the problems that we have. So it's a way of avoiding problems too. Um, but we're starting to learn that we actually have to take care of ourselves by letting others live their own lives. Don't make decisions to control others um, because it's okay to follow the linear effects of not caretaking. In other words, as a way to detach and make peace with the outcome, we have to give up control and trust that this person would often be in better hands than our own because sometimes we're not in our own best hands and we need help. And if we are constantly being a helper, we might think we're going to get constant help, but we're not, um, and it's not sustainable. And we need to face the results as would naturally occur in our own life, right? We need Others need to do that too, and without anyone's attempts to fix things or people. And this is how we free ourselves from a role of being a martyr or people pleaser where we self-sabotage by being dishonest enough to, to sell out, sacrifice our happiness, and nobody really, um, nobody really wants that. So I'm going to finish here by just saying, you know, one of the ways in which my codependency over the years tra uh, manifested was I got a lot of cut tattoos um, for a few reasons. And when I look at these uh, wavelengths, it tells me a lot because it could be that the wavelength of pain is like what we do with the wavelength of tattoos. So, for example, in the epidermis, you have red is 532 free, uh, hertz, 585 is blue, 650 is green. But I was getting all these tattoos in black and 1,064 hertz. 